Hello, brothers and sisters in Heart Dose family. I will be doing a series of teachings on reincarnation. It has become a hot topic, unfortunately, now among heart dwellers, because the teachings found on Love Letters from Jesus, a German channel on YouTube that shares Mother Claire's messages and messages from different teachers who teach on reincarnation. Mother Claire has done some videos on this subject, which I will be sharing in this series as well. However, recently it touched home when three members of the Heart Dwellers Ghana family made it known that they too believe in reincarnation, and I was dumbfounded. Two came from Jackie's channel, which makes sense. We have warned her to take the teachings of Jacob Lauber and others who affirm the reincarnation doctrine down because they're not biblical, but she continues to share them, mixing the pure teachings of Jesus and the gospel with this heretical teaching, unfortunately. I've spoken to all three members concerning this topic, and one wasn't willing to abandon the purse of their own opinion on this and many other topics, so she left the group. Then another gave me some arguments, biblically, as to why they truly think this belief is from the Lord. As I'm doing this teaching, I must speak the truth, but be very careful to also not cast judgment on others, because I did, and the Lord admonished me for that. And I had to ask the soul to forgive me. Because this soul loves the Lord, just like any Christian who may believe in this doctrine. There is simply disorder in their theology, and the Lord wants me to address that. I have concluded that the root of those who believe in this doctrine comes from them not wanting to see people suffer in hell. However, there lies the open door. When one reasons with themselves as to what God can, shouldn't do, or should do, then a doctrine is created, as this one was created to give people a second chance in life, which leaves no room to trust in God's goodness or in His justice. So in this teaching, I want to touch on the three arguments this soul pointed out to me that made their belief of reincarnation in hopes to bring clarity, truth, and understanding to those who may be listening and also believe in re and also believe in reincarnation. The first thing they mentioned to me was about near death experiences and how that confirms reincarnation because people die and come back. However, there's all the difference between being given a second chance in life and being given a new life altogether after death. That is not the NDE experience. Reincarnation means the rebirth of a soul in a new body. And when the Lord permits souls to have a near-death experience, they come back in the same body, not in a new one. And the purpose is to testify of God's profound mercy, His grace, and to give hope to people that there is life after death. You do not get a new body and come back to earth as someone else. I don't discount near-death experiences because I believe they are very real. With all things, you must use discernment because some experiences are not from the Lord. However, in scripture, the Lord makes it clear the only way we're given new bodies is during the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 41 through 44. There are also bodies in heaven and bodies on the earth. The glory of the heavenly bodies is different from the glory of the earthly bodies. The sun has one kind of glory while the moon and stars each have another kind, and even the stars differ from each other in their glory. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they'll be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but they'll be raised in strength. They're buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. So you see, you only get a new body when you die and go to heaven. 1 Corinthians 5 1 says, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God Himself, and not by human hands. The second argument was from the scripture John 9 verses 1 through 3. Jesus heals a man born blind. 
As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. They suggested that the man was being punished for his past life. Or why else would the disciples ask if he was being punished for his sins by being born blind? Which seems like karma. The definition is in Hinduism and Buddhism, it is the sum of a person's actions in this and previous states of existence, viewed as deciding their fate in future existences. Now because of self-will in our fallen nature, there is a place for consequences to our action in all of our lives. But all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. There is willful sin and imputed sin. The disciples were referring not to his past life, but imputed sin. No child or infant is held accountable for their sins before the age of reason. However, because of the fall of Adam, every soul born into this earth has a curse of sin, imputed sin, which comes with our fallen nature. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. Blessed Mother was the only creature set apart for God's purpose who received salvation at her conception. So she was redeemed from imputed sin and did not ever willfully sin. I have done several scriptural teachings on this. Check out our playlist about Mary. So the scripture above, the disciples are not referring to the man's past life where he sinned and as a consequence was born blind. But they're asking Jesus, was it the imputed sin that all men have inherited because of the fall that has caused men to be blind. And Jesus said, no, it was the will of God to make him blind for his glory to be revealed. And it was. Last point, those who believe in reincarnation have been taught that hell is not a real place, rather state of being. In the Bible, the word hell is mentioned more than 54 times via the New King James. However, the enemy has been very crafty to come among God's people and have them break down translations to justify that hell is not actually a real place. Jesus came to preach about the kingdom of God. He continuously encouraged all to repent because the kingdom of God was at hand. Matthew 3, 2. Why did he preach repentance if there would be no real consequence to our sin? In fact, Jesus talked about hell more than anyone in the Bible. So let us simply stick to the words of Jesus from his own mouth. I got this from the gospelcoalition.org, written by Leslie Shoemaker, which summed it up so beautifully. In Luke 16, he describes a great chasm over which none may cross from there to us. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells us of a time when people will be separated into two groups, one entering into his presence, the other banished to eternal fire. Jesus doesn't only reference hell, he describes it in great detail. He says, it's a place of eternal torment, Luke 16, 23, of unquenchable fire, Mark 9, 43, where the worms does not die, Mark 9, 48, where people will gnash their teeth in anguish and regret, Matthew 13, 42, and from which there's no return even to warn our loved ones. Luke 16, 19-31, he calls hell a place of outer darkness. Matthew 25, 30, comparing it to Gehenna. Matthew 10, 28, which was a trash dump outside the walls of Jerusalem where rubbish was burned and maggots abounded. Jesus talks about hell more than he talks about heaven and describes it more vividly. There's no denying that Jesus knew, believed, and warned about the absolute reality of hell. What is the reason for hell? Jesus has to talk about hell because it's the fate that awaits all people apart from him. Because of Adam's sin, we're all guilty and deserve God's eternal punishment. Contrary to popular belief, hell is not a place where God sends those who have been especially bad. It's our default destination. We need a rescuer. We need someone to save us or we stand condemned. So we're left with two options, 
stay in our state of depravity and be eternally punished or submit to the Savior and accept His gift of redemption. The issue is those who believe in incarnation do not believe in the goodness of God. The one truth that allows me to accept the justice of hell is the indisputable certitude of the goodness of God. While the notion of hell is difficult for me to grasp, Jesus with the nail-scarred hands is worthy of my complete trust. His goodness causes me to look ultimately not to hell, but to the cross. God is both great and good. His greatness causes us to bow the knee, cry out in awe and wonder and fear Him. We realize we do not deserve salvation. We deserve punishment. His goodness, on the other hand, causes us to rise up in endless praise, grateful for a Savior. His mercy allows us to enter into His presence boldly and without fear. Because He's good, we can have a relationship with Him as a child, dearly loved and snatched from the flames of hell. In his classic Knowing God, J.I. Packer writes of the goodness and severity of God. The character of God is the guarantee that all wrongs will be righted someday. When the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed, Romans 2.5 arrives, retribution will be exact, and no problems of cosmic unfairness will remain to haunt us. God is the judge, so justice will be done. One day all that is wrong will be made right. We'll see all God's ways are good, including the demonstration of His eternal justice. For now we walk in humility and faith, trusting with the Apostle Paul, Oh, the depths and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments! How inscrutable His ways! Romans 11.33 Amen I will continue the next teaching about discernment not only testing the fruit of a doctrine or a person, but their fidelity to scripture. We must go deeper, family, or we will all be easily fooled in these last days. And the great deception hasn't even happened yet. I pray this message blessed you and caused you to really rethink your belief in reincarnation. God bless you, family, until the next message.